Hello everyone and welcome to DrivingConf, the learning journey. My name is Sam Alexov and I've been writing software on a daily basis for the last 15 years and I would really like to share with you some of my experience. Back to Basics is a new series that I have recently started which goes back to the very primitives of software development. Nothing guarantees for success more than a strong foundation. For the experienced amongst you, uh, this might be a good refresher and for those of you who are just starting your careers, I hope that you are as surprised as I was when discovering these topics. We'll start with binaries and interoperability and hopefully we'll end up with a full-blown application capable of displaying beautiful graphics, playing high-resolution audio and all of that on the most popular operating systems out there. Along the way, we might also break some myths and we should have fun doing that. Okay. As usual, before we start, a very quick disclaimer that the opinions expressed in this talk are my own, my personal ones, they don't express my employer's views on these subjects, um, and all the trademarks are obviously used for illustrative purposes. I'm not here to cover things like, uh, you know, some, some theoretical aspects of uh, computer science. Uh, I'm actually here to try all the animations in Keynote. Um, and also that includes not covering data structures and algorithms, which are valuable and they do help you, but only if, uh, you understand the problems that are being solved. So this talk will be very, very practical with actual concrete examples. And the most, in, um, actually the starting point is understanding your hardware and also understanding your operating systems. So um, there are just, a, um, we're not obviously going to cover everything, uh, but just the most important parts with, with uh, actual examples. Um, so, you do need to know uh, how your hardware is laid out and what are the, uh, the properties of uh, the machine where your software is going to run. And if you don't, you do need to write some code that is going to test for that and actually try to figure out what would be the best execution model. So um, this image does not reflect, obviously, all hardware architectures. It's here for uh, illustrative purposes. Uh, but uh, we have uh, more than one core most of the time. Um, they do have some registers. I've only put RAX here as a reference, which is the 64-bit version of the register. EAX is the 32-bit version of this register. AX16, AH is the higher 8 bits of that, and AL is the lower 8 bits of that. So this is how Intel managed to maintain uh, backwards compatibility of its software, um, just building on top of the 8-bit uh, register, A register. In the... Uh, X, you know, in the x86 architecture. And uh, this register would be present on every core. Most of the time there would be a level one cache for every core. Sometimes they do share it. So this is very important. Uh, but the most recent processors have a dedicated L1 cache per core. Um, before that, there is a prefetch of fetch and execute cycle, which is very important. It also contains a branch predictor. And I'll explain why just in a second. And you know, once you have a cache miss, um, you go up to the level two cache. If uh, you have a cache miss, you go to the level three cache, RAM, if the data is not present in RAM, I'm, I'm uh, pretty sure you've seen that. But it's, uh, we, we go and fetch it from other uh, you know, external devices. But the point here is um, generally, as a rule of thumb, one level up um, takes you an order of magnitude more uh, in, in terms of time. So if the data is not present in the level one cache, you'll go to the level two cache, which will take 10 times uh, longer. If it's not present there uh, and in the L3 cache, uh, you go to RAM, that's 10 times more. So now you're doing 100 times slower software. If it's not present in, in RAM or you want to copy it from somewhere else, like PCIe, that would be 10, time, 10 times slower than that. And we are 1,000 one thousand times slower. SSDs, HDD, finally going over the network would be 1 million times slower uh, to retrieve the uh, a predetermined set of data. How much data is what, is what cache lines are important for. So you need to make sure that um, generally when you retrieve data, you do it as per your cache line size. Um, you don't want to um, 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 make cores conflict with each other. So one core uh, preempting um, and or you know evacuating the cache of, of uh, that's being used by the other core, uh, so you can really use um, you can really misuse multi-threading in in that sense. Um, the branch predictor. So if you write code that's not predictable, uh, for example, you consume random values, uh, right? That that's that's not predictable. Um, and you have a um, a misprediction in your branch branch predictor. 
it would take many cycles uh, to clean up um, everything that has been prefetched, uh, put in cache, and to re-execute all over again on the right branch of the code. Uh, with that said, um, finally, uh, just a couple of more things. Uh, programming on the stack is much, much faster uh, because it's direct. Many times the offsets can be computed and consuming um, uh, using the heap, so dynamic memory, uh, involves indirection, right? So you don't know the address of where you of what you would like to execute. Most of the time, you do need to uh, fetch or compute the address or allocate some memory uh, in order to use it. So it's it's uh, not working well with our pipeline. Um, also, uh, as a small comment, uh, class-oriented programming does not really play play nicely in uh, this kind of uh, uh, hardware setup that we have here because all of a sudden, with um, if you don't take extreme care uh, to properly um, organize and allocate your classes, all of a sudden you're jumping all over the place, uh, consuming things from RAM, um, uh, cache misses all the time, and so on and so forth. Uh, lastly, the floating point arithmetic unit could be shared between cores or, or could even not be present in some of the cores. So um, that will generally um, lock your program or your software to a specific core. Uh, or it would make the core wait until the floating point unit is, uh, is free uh, to be used again. The operating system. So um, you do need to know what are the capabilities ex exposed. Um, so that would be um, Windows 32, 64 APIs and uh, POSIX. You do want to know generally at a high level how the scheduling is performed and when your program could be interrupted uh, and offloaded for some other program to execute. Um, and it's also important to know the performance of system calls, system calls uh, that, that you perform and how long they would take. Uh, nowadays, non-blocking approaches are preferable, so these OSs um, do expose some mechanisms to do that. On Unix, you have KQE. On Linux, you have HIPPO, um, competition ports for Windows. Um, and some of them do expose direct access API because these systems, system calls are generally slow. You don't want to uh, use them for some, and, and they can offload the program and they can raise some interrupts um, to be handled additionally related to what we said previously about uh, evicting cache and so on and so forth, OSs do expose some direct APIs uh, for uh, some of the most performance critical hardware out there, but nowadays almost everything is uh, um, performance critical, I guess. Uh, so it's good that we're seeing more and more of these direct memory mapped APIs out there. Today, as I said, we're going to cover uh, concrete examples and we start with binaries and interoperability. So covering executables on different operating systems, um, so executables are really like every single thing that executes on the machine. It's either a source code that has been tokenized parsed. The result of that is an abstract syntax tree. Uh, it has been then translated into bytecode or bitcode and then translated into actual assembly instructions linked with some other uh, assembly and encoded for a specific architecture. You can start probably at any single point of this uh, bullet list, essentially. But at the end of the day, you're always going to compile to some assembly for that particular hardware architecture and OS uh, pair. And executable just export um, an interface of how they should be loaded in the operating system. That's generally a main symbol, or as you already guessed, it's the main function. So symbols and functions are kind of, well, you can have symbols that are not functions, but symbols and functions uh, are kind of uh, synonymous in this uh, context. On Mac OS, the executable format is Mac O. Uh, on Linux and music, it's either L for A dot out, uh, which are also uh, very similar. Um, and for Windows, we have portable executables and libraries. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're executables without uh, without the main function essentially. So they do have multiple global symbols. Um, uh, we can have code libraries, uh, really many varieties: bytecode, bitcode libraries, shared libraries, static libraries. Um, now, uh, depending on the compiler, you would, you could have bytecode and bitcode libraries, which is an intermediate stage of compiling your software. Um, and some wouldn't expose those. Um, and shared libraries um, are... So for a lot of time, there has been a discussion between whether to use shared libraries and, and uh, static libraries, and people have been always leaning towards using shared libraries. Uh, but it's kind of funny because all the problems that we have by using shared libraries um, kind of get solved by using static libraries. And I see there's a small typo uh, out there. Um, so we are kind of reevaluating those choices and a lot of the software nowadays uh, can be built uh, by using static libraries. And I can remember uh, doing that on, on an actual 
production software and getting laughed at by for using static libraries. So it's nice to see that some uh, there's some out of the box reasoning. Uh, so the advantages of static libraries is that because you're sh um, you're essentially not linking the software and and optimizing it uh, during build time, uh, but you're essentially shipping um, all the instructions as they were when compiled. Uh, without being linked. Uh, at the point of linking to an actual executable, you can perform much more optimizations. Um, so we can see what actual functionality is not being used and we can cut it away. You can, uh, we can um, uh, calculate offsets, calculate some addresses. So much more optimizations from the compiler. And Linux uh, historically has been having this problem where every single distro would have a different place to put the shared libraries and to look them up and they would have different versions especially some of the core runtimes so that's why you don't have portable linux software i hope i said linux um, um, so you would get an executable for linux try to run it and it won't find a library and, and it will crash so i'll give you some examples of those kind of errors and how to solve them as well uh, because once you understand that um, it's rather trivial to solve these um, these issues so about the formats and, and they're not really issues, right? They are actually useful errors. About the formats, uh, we have on macOS, we have uh, shared libraries or dynamic libraries, which are kind of interchangeable. Uh, we have dlib and .so. On Linux and use Unixes, it's .so. And I, I'm uh, sure that you saw DLLs on Windows at some point or another. Uh, static libraries are in the format of .a uh, for, for POSIX systems, uh, like Mac, macOS, Linux, and Unix, and .lib for uh, Windows. And there are environment variables that you can change on every system to point it in the, to the right place to load these libraries. So there are different ways to link um, into those libraries. Uh, you can do that implicitly during uh, compile time by, by putting some metadata um, and some placeholders in your executable that you need a specific library to be loaded. Um, and that's it, that is the, um, so the implicit way. And you can explicitly actually uh, load the library, uh, library uh, during runtime uh, by using mechanisms uh, such as dlopen. And you can look into symbols or functions into those libraries using dlsim. And for Windows, the counterpart would be load library x and get proc address. So with that knowledge, we actually have a very powerful tool at our hands. It means that we can now start treating programs as data and we can load them, offload them, um, manipulate them, change them, do whatever we want, because at the end of the day, they all have a common interface and they are all instructions that we can interpret or, or change. So we can start manipulating uh, uh, the existing software instead of being, uh, and have, have, have more control over it instead of being afraid. Uh, compilers and linkers, well, you should know the most popular ones, uh, the most used ones. So WebVM is uh, apparently being preferred. Um, uh, for building gener um, general purpose software. Uh, the GNU compiler collection is the one that's preferred on um, in uh, Linux environments. Um, MSVC is the Microsoft uh, compiler. Uh, so the one that's now shipped with, um, uh, sorry, the runtime that's now present with, uh, with Windows 10. Um, and if you want to do POSIX uh, software on Windows, you would need some kind of intermediate um, uh, cross compiler like MinGW um, that can emulate the POSIX system uh, API. If we summarize how modern software looks like, uh, we, we would kind of have a, a very similar diagram. So we would have an API of the operating system for Mac that would be a Cocoa API or uh, the POSIX uh, standard, uh, which is also supported for the most part um, by Linux and other Unixes. Uh, but there are some specific Linux, there is some specific Linux functionality exposed by the Linux API, which is not part of the uh, POSIX standard, as we saw earlier. Things like uh, EPO, so um, uh, asynchronous file descriptors, and efficiently notifying them. Um, for Windows, we have Windows.h or the Windows 32 uh, or Windows 64 API, which are the same thing. These words are kind of used interchangeably depending on or flags during uh, compile time, depending on which kind of architecture you're programming for. Um, on top of those, uh, we generally have some kind of libc, uh, some kind of uh, C or C++ API, uh, Objective-C runtimes, MCS2 if you're running POSIX software on Windows. And on top of those runtimes, uh, we started building some interesting libraries like libjvm for uh, for the Java Virtual Machine, um, hostfxr, which enables us to host a .NET runtime and run our uh, C Sharp applications, .NET applications. V8, but it could be any other um, JavaScript compiler and runtime uh, to run our JavaScript files. And Python, also known as the best wrapper of uh, C, <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, is available in the Python um, and it runs our Python files. Uh, but these are all standing on the shoulders of some of the giants out there like libcrypto, libssl, libboost, uh, which not many people like actually, but um, it is used uh, in, in a lot of software, of the software out there. Um, GL to run our graphics, Vulkan, sorry for the typo there, uh, DirectX, Zlib for compression is all over the place, and uh, SDL for multimedia and so on and so forth. So without further ado, let's jump uh, to, to the demos, write some code, compile some executables on different, different operating systems, compile some libraries, link them together, and see how we can also have some interoperability in place uh, between the different runtimes. So um, we'll start with Hello World applications. Um, here's an executable that just prints uh, Hello World, but it also has some garbage in it. So. Uh, it has 8 megabytes of um, uh, data. So uh, we are going to compile that using CLang. And most compile so CLang, GCC, MinGW, which is again an interface on top of those, they would uh, kind of have the same interface. Um, so what we need to tell them is what is the level of optimi what we are telling them, not uh, this is an optional flag, but um, don't perform any kind of optimizations. So O0, and we want you to output into this directory the executable which you're going to create by compiling this unit of code which is our hello world.c so if we run the script uh, we'll get an executable in our macOS folder surprise surprise uh, but a few things to notice if i run the file command which is which will um output some information for this executable uh, we can see that this is a maco 64-bit executable and if I run O2, I think it was the L flag. Uh, it would essentially tell me uh, that this is linked against uh, libsystem, which is the uh, standard library that macOS provides. And we can also ask the compiler to produce um, just assembly instead of um, um, as, um, linking the file and uh, converting it into bitcode. So if we do that, it will produce this .s file. Um, so I won't make you read uh, assembly code, but I want you just to spot, which is actually quite um, easy as long as you don't need to do all the, calculate, all the offset calculations. Um, but a few things to notice, we have our um, data here at 8 megabytes of data initialized to zero and the first byte is a because this is what we asked to um, uh, our compiler to do by typing that that uh, global variable so you see it didn't by default optimize it away we told the compiler not optimized we have a get uh, greeting message uh, which is again a global and we have our main method somewhere here uh, which is as well uh, global and Finally, we can see that we have a, a, a printf call, which is something that the operating system handles. And we should be putting our result in AEX, so we are returning zero from this call. Uh, we can also ask the compiler to produce bytecode uh, by setting um, dash or some intermediate uh, representation by setting um, emit our VM and most compilers would show you um, either an abstract syntax tree of what they have so far in the uh, in the compilation uh, or in case of our VM uh, this LL file which is, I have uh, created in advance but I just run this uh, so here uh, you have we, you see we have this um, intermediate between assembly instructions with some um, offsets and sizes in place, but also at the same time, we have the concepts of function uh, printed in, in a visible text. So it's always nice to examine what the compiler is going to output uh, for uh, for uh, those specific, for some specific compilation units. Um, finally, uh, we can ask the compiler not to link the application. So we can just produce an object and we do that by passing the C flag. Uh, this will be a binary object, but it can be linked again against um, by other programs. So this is the .o file, and see it's a micro 64-bit object. 
Um, we can do the same for Windows. So we do need to we do need to install MinGW and MCS2, and right after we do that, uh, we should have a MinGW uh, terminal available. So I'll just navigate to the demo code. Just to your code quickly. Okay, so in the case of MinGW, we will, we will use the uh, GCC compiler, which is available from this environment. and everything else is uh, pretty much the same. So this is actually going to produce a ex uh, portable executable file for Windows uh, that we can run. And it's properly linked, so we don't need to worry. Uh, it's probably not this one. Okay. If I now go with, uh, maybe let's use some other application. So I use command prompt. See, now we have the Hello World MinGW uh, executable. And surprise, surprise, it does the same thing. Finally, we can use the uh, micro, my MSVC compiler uh, that comes with Visual Studio uh, if we select the uh, C and C++ applications in the install. So uh, that would be available uh, from the developer prompt. So here we're going to run cl.exe um, uh, tell it to compile our, our same source file, hello world.c and if you want to tell it the output path, we need to pass the slash uh, fe uh, parameter and this will build our hello world without the prefix. So let's do that. So you see our files are here, uh, properly compiled. And if we wanted to run that, we can say Win64, which is our output path, hello world. Okay, so we use the same source, source code file to compile with, I guess, three platforms. Let's do uh, Linux just for the sake of com completeness, but you can expect that nothing major changes in there. Uh, we'll I will compile in Linux is the following. So we run GCC uh, with basically the exact same parameters um, that we use in MinGW and also uh, CLang and tell it to output to the Linux 64 uh, folder inside bin. And we can also ask what kind of file is this? And see, it's a 64-bit ELF executable. And we can also ask MinGW because it, because it has the file utility. Otherwise, you can use um, a file a command version for Windows, uh, which also works. We're going to ask what is the type of the Windows executables. So let's do hello world.exe. So it's a portable executable. And we can also, 32 bit by the way, and we can also do hello world in GW uh, portable executable uh, plus, uh, which I think was done to host the uh, 64 bit versions. Okay, um, let's do some libraries. Back on the OSX machine, um, 
what I've done is that we are going to compile greetings dash it dot c, uh, which is essentially um, just a library that has two methods: get greetings message, get exit message, and it has some garbage. I actually forgot to show you the file sizes, so this was very, very important um, of the of the final executables. So if we see for macOS. The file size is 8 megabytes. And that would be the same here. So the compiler did not optimize absolutely anything in our case. Both the Windows one and MinGW. And it's pretty much the same for Linux. Okay, so we'll do some optimizations later as well. Uh, let's do libraries quickly. So again, I've purposely put some eight megabyte garbage in the general purpose library uh, that we won't use, but what we will use from this library is get greeting message. Um, this time, hello world in this library is in Italian, that's why the dash it, and there is also a Bulgarian version of the library that has hello world in Bulgarian. Uh, but they do keep the same interface. So the interface is defined in the header file, which is generally inside the include directory. Uh, and we expose all these functions ex externally. Uh, the additional code is, uh, for, is done for Windows because uh, we need to put an export signature uh, for, the, for the Microsoft uh, toolchain. And if we compile this, so we will use the 00, zero compile library it, but I think you saw the script. So it's going to call the CLang compiler, uh, pass the dynamic leap, leap flag, or for Linux, this is dash shared. Uh, we need to pull, uh, point it to our include directory, so where the headers are defined, so that when we actually compile the greeting seed compilation unit, it will look into the header. Uh, and folder and it, it includes folder and it will find that uh, specific header and we say that we want to output this library in, uh, in our lib64 folder. There is no official convention for this but uh, this is being followed for 64-bit uh, applications now apparently. Okay, and if we check you can see that this is a Mac all 64-bit dynamically linked shared library and we thought who we can see that it also links against uh, lib system for Mac OS. Another uh, POSIX utility is nm, so we can do nm-g and our library. And nm can actually show us the symbols being exported by a particular uh, collection of, of uh, executables. So we see here, we export our buffer, uh, which means that we are preserving the 8 megabyte size of garbage. We are exporting our exit message and we are exporting our get greetings message. Okay, now how do we build a static library? Well, um, the process is fairly similar, uh, but we don't need to link it, remember. So we call our compiler, we pass the O2 flag, um, just to make sure that we run some basic optimizations. Uh, we enable uh, link time optimizations. Some compilers need to do that while building the stat static library so that these optimizations can work when the library is linked. Others don't. Um, I'm not particularly sure about CLang on OS X, but it appears that I need to enable the LTO flag when I build the static library. Again, uh, the library source code itself uh, includes its header. So we need to include that in our... Uh, um, we need to include the folder in our build script and um, then we want to indicate to the compiler um, not to, to make the addressing um, uh, portable and not to use um, 
absolute uh, addresses. Uh, with that, we then create an archive of the object file and we put it in a, in a different library than our um, shared one. If a shared library and a static library are in the same folder, when you try to link to them, most compilers will generally prefer the shared library. So let's go ahead and do that. By the way, don't worry about this uh, warning attribute. Um, unknown error. This is uh, an attribute that we've put into the source code for a, for a different um, toolchain. So if we look into our static folder, uh, we can see that uh, we have the Italian library compiled. Previously I've compiled the uh, Bulgarian Hello World library as well, uh, but we can do that again. Uh, the only thing that changes, of course, is the compilation unit. So instead of compiling the dash it uh, source code, we compile the dash bg. And we can also uh, compile our shared library in Bulgarian, which is this script right here. And dynamic for macOS, shared for other operating systems. I'm not going to run this demo on, on uh, Linux, uh, Windows, and uh, MinGW uh, for Windows, but all the source code files are here and I'll share them with you. So if you want to play with this um, on your operating system, if it's different from, from Mac, you can just download the source code and try this for yourself. Again, as you saw, not much changes. Generally, we use a different compiler. Uh, dynamic, like some of the flags have a different name, but most of the time we tell the compiler exactly the same things. How much to optimize, where to find headers, which files to compile. Um, and what the output needs to be. Okay, so let's have a peek in our lib64 macOS folder. We have our 8 megabyte um, static libraries and in our static folder, nothing should have changed so far. So um, there are our static libraries as well. So on Linux, this, should, this would be a dot .so. Um, on Windows, this would be a .dll, and on Linux, this would be this would remain .a, and on Windows, this becomes a .lib file. But the purpose of these is all the same, and we can link to them uh, with different levels of, uh, of optimization, as I already said. Um, so you can you can play with the with these files. I've also included uh, Linux in the most recent version. Uh, which is basically the same as in OS X almost, so not much changes. Again, POSIX systems are very similar, so most of the time the issue is between source code that should run on Windows and source code that should run on um, POSIX. Um, so let's actually start using our libraries. Uh, for that purpose, we need to uh, link into them. So um, First of all, I have a script that doesn't work, so we're going to call our, our compiler uh, with, a, uh, with an executable source code file. So we have a main, we want to call the get greeting message from our library. We have included the header in the source code and we still have some garbage to optimize away. But if I call this script, I think it was zero, zero. I'm in the wrong folder, of course. So this is a very typical error. So some file .h was not found. Well, what this means is that in our compilation script uh, of all the directories we needed to include, we didn't include the one that contains this particular header file. In our example, we didn't include any directory. So we need to fix our script a little bit and pass the i flag to include the directory where our header file greetings.h is located. Another very common error. Of course, that's the wrong script. Is that once we compile during the linkage, uh, we get this undefined symbols for architecture, blah, 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 the architecture you're compiling for. Um, which symbol was not found and where it was referenced from. So what it says here is that in our main method of the hello world object, uh, we are trying to use a get greetings, great greeting message, but that was not found. So generally these kinds of um, 
errors are because we didn't tell the compiler where to find the library where this particular symbol was implemented. And the way we do that is by passing the um, dash L capital. So you see a small pattern here. Whenever we need to point to directories, we pass a capital I for includes, L for libraries. So we point our compiler to a folder that contains the static library in this case. And then we say, we want you to link greetings dash it. Now there is a convention here. Uh, when we pass the library, it automatically searches for files that have the lib prefix and then for the platform, the appropriate extension. So in this case, it would be the lib. So this is a convention because uh, when we try to compile on other operating systems, we don't need to change our compilation scripts to look for a particular uh, platform extension. Um, so we link to the greeting seat library. And as you saw, I erroneously ran the script earlier. It actually compiled and it put the output into bin Mac OS uh, hello world. Now, what happens if we're trying to run this file? Another interesting error that we very often get is library not loaded. Um, so we did compile our executable successfully, but then it was unable during loading uh, to find our lib greetings it dot dlib. And that's generally because we didn't tell the operating system when we try to load the file, uh, where to uh, seek for our library. Now, different operating systems would look in different places, but as I showed you earlier, an easy way to um, do that is to either include um, the library in the folder where it's looking for. So in this case, it's looking into lib64 macOS lib greetings it, and we don't have the library there, so we can just copy it. And we'll copy this into our local lib64 folder, or we can just uh, link to it, of course. But if I run the script now, we get a hello world message. A different way, so let me clean it, clean it again and try to run, we get an error, is on macOS to pass this environment variable, which tells the, which tells the operating systems in which folders uh, to look for, uh, for libraries. So, We'll say DOD library path as an environment variable equals this. And we will actually point it into our one libraries lib6 uh, folder, the main folder. And then we will execute our binary again. And it's actually looking into the root. So we need to say lib64 um, my quest. And this is where our library is. And it runs. Um, now, an interesting thing is that if the same program, our Hello World, links to our Bulgarian library, because it has the same signature, remember the only thing that, that links this, that connects these li um, codes together is basically signatures. So get greeting message uh, can be called from one assembly or from another, from one um, library or another. We can essentially compile our code uh, to link against the Bulgarian library, and all of a sudden, we start outputting messages in Bulgarian. So I'll call that zero um, three, which is going to compile our source code, but this time link against greetings dash bg. And if I run it, I mo I'll most probably get an error because I don't have the file here. I don't have the library in that folder. So you see, so Linux is constantly um, hitting errors like this because there is no convention on where, no single way and convention of where to put libraries, when to see, look for them. And also, well, there are some, but they're not respected across the, the different distributions. And also the, there will be different versions. So maybe there is a version of our library which does not have the uh, get greeting message. So they would be binary, um, they would be incompatible on the binary level. I'll just pass the same DLD library path. For Linux, this is LD library path, and for Windows, it just looks into your path system variable. Oops, uh, I did the same error again. Lib64, macOS. There we go. Now, um, one thing I want you to notice, well, let's link with the static library. 
So this is exactly the same, but we just point our compiler to the static version of our library this time. And we're going to optimize with some flags, especially link time optimization. And I want you to notice something. So this is the 0-7 script. And I already do have a bunch of um, uh, binaries in this folder. But look what we have now. So the Bulgarian executable we compiled, uh, the Hello World in Bulgarian executable, is 8 megabits. But what does this do? So it didn't optimize away the garbage. And additionally, it's going to load the BG library, which has another 8 megabits of garbage inside. And this would be 16 megabits of non-optimized code sitting here. Now, if we enable the optimization flags, it can actually see that our Hello World uh, code here does not use this data um, <coughs> storage um, data variable and it can optimize it away so it suddenly becomes 49 kilobytes but this is still going to load our shared library because uh, it's shared it, that one was not optimized so if we actually look into our libraries folder you see, our shared libraries were not optimized because they are general purpose. The compiler doesn't know whether we are using that particular um, um, data, that particular variable or not. So we've managed to half the size. So we're actually running at 8 megabits now. But this is not memory that we are using productively in any way. And with the static library, because um, we passed some link time optimization flags, and here, uh, we're not going to load libraries from anywhere. The, the greetings-bg code has been incorporated into our statically linked executable. Our total size is 50 kilobytes. So we now have an executable that can use 50 kilobytes of memory, and we have one that can actually use 8 megabytes. So you decide which one is, is more efficient. And of course, the added advantage of static execu uh, statically linked executables is that um, they don't have any of these um, looking for libraries plague because the, the code is um, already part of the executable. All, all the library code is already a part of the executable. Of course, they do have these advantages, but in terms of optimizations, uh, th this, uh, th there's no um, better way than this probably if we're looking to reduce the amount of, and also to make sure that our binary is going to run on, on, on any system. Uh, we've tried fighting this problem with, with many interesting uh, other ways like running things into containers uh, downloading all the possible dependencies every time in a container image we try to run an executable just to make sure that it runs properly uh, meanwhile you just statically linked an executable and you're good, good to go um, and i'm probably going to get a lot of critique and backlash for this but um, um, that's just the reality so more efficient executables uh, because they can be link type optimized and they don't have they're not uh, plagued by um, dependencies all over the places. So um, another interesting compilation target is this one, Web WASI and WebAssembly. So uh, you see, we still need to build our library for different operating systems. And what WASI defines is it defines a common runtime. Um, that's not the Windows one, it's not the Mac OS one, it's the WASI one, it's the cross-platform one. And we can build targeting this um, this runtime. So if we download the WASI SDK, uh, so, so that's basically the same approach of WebAssembly, right? We enable a system interface across the web. If we use their, their compiler, uh, we can actually compile our libraries. There is still no format for, um, for um, static libraries or shared libraries. So we can only output like objects now uh, that we can use to link uh, later in our executables. Um, and this is this is what uh, what that attribute that other compilers didn't recognize is for because our libraries now uh, wouldn't have an entry point. Uh, the only way to um, make sure that these symbols are preserved and compiled is to put some attributes on the methods. I'm uh, speaking a bit vaguely, but I'm referring to this attribute here. So this is used for our WebAssembly compilation, uh, and it's, we're essentially telling what what export name to use. Uh, but we're doing that so that the compiler would preserve our symbol. And we can also do um, an executable. So optimize link time optimizations, 
pretty much the same flags that we use, but this time the output is .wasm. And if we run that, by the way, I'm just running this again to make sure that something didn't change in the meantime, but you, you'll, you'll see that I've run them in the past. So now we have our Hello World Wasm that was optimized, all the garbage was removed also from the Greetings BG and Greetings ET uh, libraries. And we can use different ways now to run this program, but one of them is uh, Wasm Time, which implements the uh, Wasm system interface. So it can pretty much load our Hello World Wasm, and there we go. And these outputs are totally usable by, by WebAssembly. So now we use our single code base to run across how much, like five different platforms, uh, but it gets even better. So let's, um, you, you see that um, specifying every time the compiler and the flags isn't really fun, uh, especially having like how much like 12, 13 different scripts to run. Of course, we can wrap all this in, in, into one script for all the different platforms. Uh, but it's just it's just painful. So uh, one of the solutions for this is uh, um, make files, uh, make as a program. You've probably seen it elsewhere. And this is just uh, an easy way to specify what compiler we're using. Uh, but these are environment variables, by the way. So we can also uh, use these environment variables without make. So we can generally tell what compiler we would like to use, uh, what flags, what linking flags, and where the output want, uh, needs to be. Um, but makes make uh, makes it easy to resolve dependencies. So we can say that we want to compile hello world. We can world. We can say um, what dependency it has. So make will automatically uh, find these um, dependencies and it will compile them uh, if we tell make how to compile those. So in this case, we're saying you need to compile the .o object of hello world. This is how you compile it by using that compiler with those flags. And finally, you need to link it and you need to put the output here. So it's a more clever way um, to do those shell scripts and, and configurations. And we can do also some checks. Um, so if we are running, running on Windows, we actually want to pass some other flags that are specific to Windows. If we are running on Windows on MinGW, uh, we want to do those instead, maybe change our outputs, change our flags. So I'll run that very quickly, but uh, the idea here was that you will encounter these make files very often and you shouldn't be afraid of them. So just run make in the folder. It will run the default target which is in this case is hello world and there we go we have our output great um cmake is another one which is a little bit more evolved so with cmake um, we kind of do the same so uh, we set our we set some compiler flags um, we can say what we want to produce. So in this case, we're working on a project that's called Hello World. We want it to have an executable, uh, which is built using this uh, source code uh, from our previous uh, folder. Um, we also want to link to a library, which is the greetings library, and it's going to be static. And we tell CMake how to import that. Uh, at the end, we want to link Hello World to the greetings library. So you see, it's a little bit of a higher level uh, way to, to do that. Um, the way we use it is that generally the convention is that we have a build folder. And in this build folder, we run CMake from the previous uh, level. So our CMake list file is here. Um, and it's going to um, essentially configure our program and produce a make file in our build directory because this is the default generator. Def by default, it's going to produce a make file. And if we run this make file, um, our program will compile link. Uh, so it's, you see it's a little bit more elegant way. The nice thing about CMake is that it can produce Ninja build files, which is a different build system uh, heavily used by Google and, and other C++ projects, but it can also produce um, a Visual Studio uh, files. Um, so a v sorry, Visual Studio solutions and projects um, that, that can be compiled from our same code base. Uh, and to do that, we need to pass G. So we are saying, CMake, I want you to use the Visual Studio generator, this particular version. And in our build folder, we have a Visual Studio solution. So um, this is all nice and great, but we don't want to write all of our source code in C and C++. Um, we want the pieces that need to be fast to be in C and C++. 
or C++. Uh, but most of the time, we really just want to write our uh, Java, C Sharp, JS, Python. At least these are my favorite languages. So I'll show you a way, uh, of, of course, on the browser as well. I'll show you a way to essentially do the same, um, whether implicitly or explicitly, by using your favorite managed language. So in C Sharp, um, the way you go into these static libraries is by using uh, the DOL import attribute, which essentially does uh, a, a DOL open or a load library on Windows and a uh, DSIM or a um, get proc address on Windows to essentially load the DL, a static library. And then we can go into it. So we declare it as a static external. And we do need to do some marshalling. So every time we move data from, from one language to another, from one convention set to another, we need to do some marshalling of the of the language. So, of the data, sorry. Um, let me show you that very quickly. I'll do a .NET run. Well, let's rebuild just in case. Um, .build. <laughs> And we can do a um, .NET run. Now you see what we are going to run here is our write line, and it's going to print our greetings, get greetings message from our library. There we go. Um, if we load a different library, it will be the same. So we're just loading another piece of data that's also executable, then we know how to interpret it. Um, and we, when we go through the operating system, it actually marks which regions of the data are actually executable, right? Then uh, we can do the same in Java. So for Java, uh, the process is a little bit more involved. There are some headers, um, but let's say we have a simple Java program that print lines um, a native method, a result from a native method. In this case, we're going to call this native because we need to provide some glue code for Java to be able to marshal the data. There is no automatic way in which it can marshal the data. There are some other libraries like Swig that we can use um, to generate the, that glue code, but it really depends on, on, on how you'd like to do that. Um, so, in, and then we need to statically call once, you know, when we load the program, we need to call load library and give a reference to our glue code. So this is not the actual BG or it library that we have. This is a glue code library. And we need to implement that glue code library ourselves. Now, um, I think it was uh, Java C dot, dot H, uh, dash H that can produce an automated header for the glue code. So let me see that very quickly. So we can do Java C dash H. Uh, it will generate the, the header in this folder program.java and we have our header here and we need to implement it so we can create a small C program that includes our remember this is the glue code so we're going to link into our greetings um, header signature um, then when we build this code we're going to link into the library and into the glue code, we need to say what happens. So essentially, we're going to return a new UTF string, and uh, that will be coming from get greetings message from our shared library. This is all the glue code we need to provide, and we need to compile it. So in order to compile this, um, here I use GCC, but you can use any other compiler. Um, we need to point it. Uh, one of the includes, as you saw, is um, sorry, not here, but here is JNI.h. So we need to include the folder where JNI.h is located. It's in the Java Home Include directory. Uh, then we need to include some uh, platform specific, so um, the Darwin includes in uh, in the Java Home. Uh, we're going to output our static library, uh, sorry, shared library here. That's shared, remember. And we're going to build our program.c finally. Um, linking into our greetings dash bg library. So if we do that, there is no greetings. Uh, I probably moved folders, so let's see. 
Um, yeah, I, I move this one folder up, so this should be like this. And I probably need to change the library folder. Okay, so now... Well, we did build. Um, so now uh, we need to run our Java program and see if it works. So remember, in, in our main, we're just printing get native, which is going to call our new code and get uh, from our library the, the greeting message. There we go. Calling into native code. Um, so now let's do Node.js as well. Uh, for Node.js, we have, and then V8, we have uh, JIP as a build system, uh, very similar to make and CMake. Uh, more like CMake because it produces uh, build scripts. So here we say um, we want to build a greetings module. These are our. Th this is where our headers are, um, and we. Um, I want you to link into our greetings dash it library, and the source code to compile is greetings.cc. Some marshalling involved here as well. So we do need to provide some V8 glue code. Um, essentially what will be exported and this is also the initialize method that sets uh, what messages would be visible to javascript in this case it's uh, what methods would be visible to javascript uh, in this case is the get greetings message and it's implemented by the method function um, this is v8 specific but essentially getting us a sandbox uh, where we can call our get greetings message put the result um, into the return arguments of, of uh, this call Then once it gets compiled, which will probably go here, but let us do that uh, quickly. Um, so you see, um, JIP actually generates make files. Let's see if I remember the syntax. Uh, it should be no JIP configure. Uh, I think I changed my Node.js version here, so probably I need to change this back to something else. But uh, if it works, it's going to build our greetings.o object. So you see, we, we get this error where we're actually using. So so this is where all the, the, the static, the shared libraries errors uh, again manifest. Like uh, we're using some libraries that were built for 10.13, but now we're building on 12.0. Um, essentially, this is the Node.js version that we're using. So if we switch to a newer version, um, but it's very difficult to, to, to pinpoint an exact version where it wouldn't get warning messages. And then we can just run our program.js. Ciao mondo. Uh, what we do here is just require a build um, the Node.js executable file um, that was in the uh, just built by Node.js in our build release folder. So the script that we generated using Node.js, very similar to CMake, generated some make files, which, which we can also run manually. And the output is actually here. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is a binary file, so yeah, it cannot be opened. Um, a library that then, get, then gets um, loaded by the Node.js uh, runtime. Same with Python. So Python, because it's so close to C, it doesn't have um, much marshalling that needs to be done. It just needs to be informed on what kind of types uh, we are going to move back and forward. So uh, we can use the C types module uh, to load our greetings BG. And depending on the platform, this will either load, um, again, uh, using the methods uh, that we saw, um, the open and dsim for POSIX, or it will use load library and get proc address for Windows. Uh, our function does not have any return types, um, any return values. It's a void function. Uh, sorry, does not accept any arguments. Um, it's a void function uh, for for the input, and as a return, we get a pointer to uh, to character bytes. And if we run it. we get our string back. Um, using buffer right here because it um, because our output is UTF-8 and this supports UTF-8. It actually just uh, writes to the console which supports UTF-8. Finally, WebAssembly. 
Um, I just took the libraries we compiled earlier, and we have some JavaScript code to load the Italian library and the Bulgarian library as WASM modules. Uh, we go into the get greetings message. We actually get a pointer. Remember, everything is addresses in memory. So we, we get the offset in memory where our message begins. And then we need to convert that string from memory at the offset into something that's usable by JavaScript. And the way we do that is uh, characters in C and are not terminated. So when the string ends, there is basically a zero. That's how uh, there's a zero byte. So we just walk through the array and we, we count our length. And this is where we get the length of the message. And then we can say, okay, at this offset, take this amount of bytes. And we just take the coder to uh, translate them into UTF-8, interpret them as UTF-8. So I can run, if I am again on the right Node.js version, I should be able to run an HTTP server. And I'm not, because I probably deleted it. Uh, let's see if 18 has it. Yeah, so... Oh, I, I uh, ran it on the wrong directory. Should be WebAssembly. And we print Ciao Mondo and the race yet um, to the console. Okay. Um, now, with all this knowledge, we can we can do even, even more interesting things. So we can actually write a, a runtime that loads um, the common language runtime that loads the Python runtime that loads the JVM, it loads V8. Um, and we can use then higher level languages uh, as, as scripting tools um, to provide some programmability over our C and C++ implementations. So I've, I've written the code to essentially load JVM, load Python, uh, load JS, uh, V8 in this case, and to load CLR, we can have a look at it. And then uh, I defined a, like um, a convention of how um, I would like to provide some programmability. In, in this case, it's a very simple thing. We ask our plugins to implement a tick method, and we're going to call that tick method with some string. Of course, this is a very simple interface just to prove um, um, the idea of how it, it might work. And then you would like to have something more sophisticated to provide more um, programmability. Uh, over your runtime. And for JS is the same, so it's a tick method. Uh, for .NET, I actually have them in a separate folder. So you just have a static class with a static tick method. Uh, remember, we need to do some marshalling here. And for our Java, we don't need to do uh, much. Again, it's a static method. And we print. Now, um, going into... So we, we provide very simple interfaces like what COR, tick CLR for our tick functionality that we want to call recurrently. Um, the same here, so tick.js, load.js. Um, forgot that I implemented the JVM as a header um, file, but the JVM loading as a header file, but for Python, you can say tick Python, uh, load Python. And I wouldn't necessarily go into the implementation of these, but um, they kind of do the same thing. So they locate the Python um, Initialization procedures, call them so that the Python run sorry the runtime of reference in this case Python is, is initialized properly, and then we look uh, for a tick function um, in our source code. We get the address of that, so this is generally an address somewhere in memory that we want to call, and every time we want to call tick, uh, we essentially marshal our native data into something that Python understands. We call the function with that. And we need to make sure our memory is freed back. Uh, Java, more or less the same. Bootstrap the JVM. Uh, we find our plugin class. We find our tick method. And when we need to call the tick from our runtime, we call, we marshal the data, call a static void method use, using um, JNI. Um, 
and we want to make sure that again memory is free right after we are done. Uh, we can do also more sophisticated memory management, but <clears throat> this is just enough. Um, for JavaScript, we need to load the V8 runtime, um, linking it to lib plat platform and V8. Um, you can forget about this. It's just a custom console implementation uh, that we then expose to JavaScript. But the idea is that it wouldn't um, it wouldn't buffer uh, it wouldn't flush the output buffers uh, once we log because I wanted to do some benchmarking later. And in our tick.js method. Um, we need to respect some uh, V8 calling conversion. So we need to acquire a handle. We need to acquire our local context for this scope. Um, um, we need to marshal our arguments. And finally, go into our function, again, tick. And we got a reference from that earlier in the code when we loaded actually V8. So see, we actually load our JavaScript file as a string and compile it with V8. And this is where we acquire, uh, sorry, this is where we acquire a reference to our tick function. And for COR, it's a little bit more involved, but again, because we have the headers, I'm just uh, using some code from Microsoft here. Um, we know when to look into the host FXR library to be able to load a, commonly, a, a COR, COR uh, host. <clears throat> the right way. So, um, I've hard coded some paths here, but this is essentially where I have my .NET um, version installed. And we can, just to show you the explicit way of loading these libraries. So, on Windows, we call load library and get proc address. On POSIX systems, we call DL open and uh, DL sim. Uh, to look in for the address of a particular function that we're interested in. And this is how we can dynamically, dynamically load and unload um, and extend our code base and our runtimes. Um, and here is, it's more or less the same. So we, we do get a function pointer uh, into a particular method of our um, .NET uh, type. So this is the type that we want in this case, driving plugin and the tick method. So, Quite involved, but again, this provides so much functionality to our uh, um, to our application and and some nice scripting on top. So uh, really nice to have um, such extend extend extensibility of the application. Um, I will jump into our runtime. So the way we compile this is that uh, there is some C plus plus involved, which is <coughs> the choice. Sorry for that. The choice for V eight is to write it in C plus plus. And uh, for COR um, as well, um, or at least uh, to have the interfaces like that. So the easiest uh, thing that we can do, uh, instead of fighting the decision of the um, developers of those libraries and trying to load it into C, uh, to compile it with C or something like that, um, or load it with C, uh, it's just easier to use C++ in this case. Um, and here, uh, we don't link into anything because for CIOR, we actually do a dynamic lookup during runtime. So we don't need to um, link into .NET or something like that. We're going to load that by loading a library from the disk explicitly. Um, the same is for, uh, so we're going to output this as our own library called libcir. So this is something that we built. And then we can have a libjs built in a very similar way. In this case, I'm pointing into my local build of V8. I really hope I didn't delete that <laughs> for the demo. Um, yeah, hopefully I didn't. Um, we pointed to the uh, V8 build library and we link into V8 monolith, which implements all the methods that we need to run uh, V8. So these are um, these are all static libraries that we're creating. Uh, then we want one more library, which is for Python. So we point it into our local Python installation uh, right, this is actually the final build and the one that follows up below is something else. So I, I decided it would be very fun to run some benchmarks and we're going to do that in closing. So um, we call our driving, uh, we, we compile our driving runtime.c, um, the one that loads all the, all the other runtimes. Uh, we compile py.c and then we make sure we also link into Python and we link into uh, the JVM. 
and we link into our local library with JS, and link, we link into our local library um, that loads the CLR. So quite involved, but again, because now we understand how to manipulate uh, programs of this and, and libraries and uh, code of this is possible. So, and we can do much more actually probably for for future versions of uh, of this talk. Uh, we probably want to create our own language, have that run um, besides all the other languages. Um, uh, but we, we we need to make a careful decision on that. Uh, so let's compile. And we should have um, inside bin driving should be our, our runtime, but I actually have a dedicated script to run it because we want to tell the Python runtime not to buffer standard out uh, for performance reasons. We need to um, tell it from, when, from where to look for pack, uh, Python packages. And remember, our Python packages is inside plugins, driving plugin.py. Um, we tell the JVM, uh, we actually tell uh, macOS from where to look for, uh, for the JVM, and we pass some arguments for, um, for our Python plugin, but this could generally be skipped. There's a better way to do this. Um, generally, instead of hard coding all, the, all these uh, plugin file names, uh, it would be better to scan at low time what to load and whatnot. So uh, let's run this. Uh, remember, every language will output its initials or its um, abbreviation, so pi, and then it would print also the input parameter that's being called, so js input parameter, and for Java, j input parameter, c sharp message. So if we run that, uh, which is actually coming, of course, from a pointer to that memory, which we are marshalling uh, into a string. Uh, there we go. Our, our uh, runtime is calling every second into, uh, into the other runtimes, incrementing a counter. So quite fun. And uh, I think that we can uh, get creative and uh, do some other interesting things. In closing, um, I'll leave you to a nice benchmark here. Please don't make conclusions, but if you can spot some interesting spikes, um, that would be one of the reasons to get involved into building something similar like this, or at least some strong foundations that can provide for, for further extensions in the future. This will be the last demo that we do for today. So please enjoy.
Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that this material was valuable to you and have fun watching the rest of the sessions.